in Tel Aviv, images that change everything. After days on the razor's edge, Ukraine is now a nation at war. It won't be bloodless. The port of entry is now closed. The sharing of bias and false news has become all too common. Talk of rebuilding the temple is no longer considered a fringe idea. Good morning. Are you ready? Look up. Look up. If you're visiting with us, welcome. We're glad you're here. We're in a message series entitled Look Up, Hope for the Future. And if there's anything all of us need, here's the reality. We need hope. And when you look around the world today, you see trouble. You see trouble in so many places. And maybe you sometimes even wonder, is there really any reason to have hope? Jesus said this in John chapter 16, verse 33. He said, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Now there's a big difference between little t tribulation and big t tribulation. Jesus is saying in this world you're going to have some little t tribulation. There's going to be some trouble. But then he goes on to say what? Take heart. Say it with me. Take heart. I have overcome the world. I hope you lean in. I hope you get your notepad out, your iPad, whatever you're taking notes on. The message of Chapel Hill Church has always been this, that our hope is found in Jesus Christ. That's why every week, whether it's myself or Pastor Daniel, we preach and teach Jesus. We preach and teach that there's hope for your marriage. There's hope for your kids. There's hope for your work. There's hope for your finances. There's hope for your future. We have the hope of heaven and Jesus is our living hope. Come on, somebody praise the Lord with me right now. Jesus is our living hope. But you and I both know the world is in trouble. And if you have any awareness of global news, you know about the trouble that's happening today. You know about the trouble at our southern border. You probably know about the fentanyl problem. You probably know about inflation and the trouble of crime in our cities. You probably know about the trouble of Russia and Ukraine. And the Middle East is a powder keg. You might know by now, by just late yesterday, yesterday afternoon, Iran attacked Israel. Now, I, God's got a... God's doing a pretty good job of giving us a soundtrack for this message series, isn't he? Gave us an earthquake a couple weeks ago, a solar eclipse, and now we've got Iran attacking Israel during this series. But Israel remains today on the highest level of alerts. Enemy ha Israel has enemies on all sides, um, facing anti-Semitism at levels never seen before. And so I think for a church that stands with Israel, we ought to put our prayer where, where our statement is. And I think we ought to pray right now for Israel and Israel's leaders. We do this consistently on Wednesday nights at our prayer gathering. I think on this Sunday morning, we should stand and pray with Israel. Would you stand with me right now? And let's just do that right now. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Come on, slip up your hand if you're comfortable doing that. We come to you in the name of Jesus and we declare, Behold, he that keepeth Israel will neither slumber nor sleep, for the Lord is our keeper. The Lord is our helper. Lord, the psalmist said, The Lord is Israel's shade at her right hand. And so, Lord, we stand in agreement. Lord, together for Israel, we pray for Prime Minister Netanyahu as he leads and for his cabinet and those of the Knesset. Lord, we pray for the decision makings, making that is being done right now in their security meetings. We pray for the IDF, for all the military leaders that are, uh, that are facing enemies on all fronts, on all sides, multiple fronts. So, Lord, we pray for them. We pray for America's ironclad commitment and support with Israel. Come on, pray in agreement with me, Lord, that, yes, President Biden and his administration would stand strong with Israel in this hour and in these days. We ask all these things in your name, your precious name, Jesus. Amen and amen. Praise God. You can be seated. That's not all there is to be concerned about. Obviously, many believe that China is America's greatest threat right now. With the deep divide in American politics, it doesn't, it doesn't look good. It doesn't feel good right now. The world is not getting better. But in this world, Jesus said, you will have trouble. In this world, you will have tribulation. 
And I'm thinking, no wonder church attendance is on the rise. You hear reports of church attendance is decreasing. I don't think those churches are preaching the Bible. Because Bible preaching churches, the friends I'm talking to, church attendance is on the rise. Most all of us had the highest attendance we've ever had on Easter, praise God. And here we are a couple weeks after Easter, and we got on almost full 1130 here at Chapel Hill in Douglasville. Praise God for that. But I believe this. I believe there's a reason for that. I believe it's because people need hope. Number two, people are looking for truth. And we're going to continue to bring truth, whether I'm speaking or Pastor Daniel or we'll have a guest speaker. We are going to bring you the truth, and we're going to do it boldly. Today we're going to talk about the truth of Big T Tribulation. Now, we all like to hear about the love of God, but not so much about the wrath of God or about judgment. But how many of you know love and wrath are two sides of the same coin? You say, well, what do you mean? An early Christian author said, he who does not get angry does not care. Well, think about that. I think we understand this. If you have a loved one who has been assaulted or abused in some way, what's your response? Indifference? Absolutely not. It's anger. Why? Because you love. Why would we expect God who is love? He is love. His very nature is love. God is love. Why would we expect God to respond any different? And his love and his judgment are both seen in the end times. Now, what do I mean about the end times? Let me try to catch everybody up for just a moment. If you missed any of our previous messages, please go back and listen. The Bible has much, much, much to say about Israel in the end times. It also has much to say about deception and apostasy. Pastor Daniel preached a message about that in week two of our series. The Bible has much to say about the rapture. We talked about that last week. It also has much to say about today's topic. And that topic is the seven-year tribulation period, which I believe is immediately following the rapture, which I'll say the tribulation is a somber warning for the unbeliever. Let me say it again. It is a somber warning for the unbeliever. See, when you hear words like the end times or, or, or the apocalypse or Armageddon or global destruction, you may just think, ah, that's just science fiction or, or that's just the movies. But here's what I think about when I hear those words. I think about the Bible. I think about the future. I think about what God says is still to come because this is all about biblical eschatology. What is eschatology? Eschatology is the study of future things. See, one day Jesus is going to return. Jesus is going to return to right the wrongs and the Bible tells us what's going to happen and it tells us in detail. And rather than think, well, that's just outrageous or that's just crazy. Well, well, maybe, but only if you don't have an understanding of the Bible or if you don't believe it. But we believe it. First, because we're dispensationalists in our interpretation of Scripture and of future things. Meaning, what do I mean by that? Meaning we interpret the Bible literally. And that God works in different ways with Israel and he works in different ways with this church throughout the ages of time or different dispensations. Yet salvation is always by grace through faith alone, whether it be for Jew or Gentile. It's by grace through faith. And then secondly, we believe it's because God's word has never been wrong. Now let that sink in for just a moment. God's word has never been wrong. Somebody's interpretation of God's word could be wrong, but God's word has never been wrong. Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. When you hear God's word and you believe it is the inerrant word of God, you should say, Amen. Amen means so be it. God's word is so be it. So when we hear God's word, you hear Pastor Daniel bringing the word next Sunday, it ought to be Amen, 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 because it is a so be it word. It is forever settled in heaven. One sound measure of prophetic accuracy is the predictor's track record. Let me say it again. One sound measure of prophetic accuracy is the predictor's track record, right? A track record is pretty important. If a prophet is saying something, you want to know if what he said before really happened, right? So the track record. And by that measure, the Bible has no equal. Every event prophesied in Scripture has occurred with pinpoint accuracy. 
And we're going to talk about something that's going to occur in the future. But it's occurred with pinpoint accuracy. The flood of Noah, the famine in Egypt, the captivity of the Jews and their return to the homeland, the rise and fall of nations from Babylon to Rome, the destruction of Jerusalem, and of course, the birth and death of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible has a track record, Andy, of 100% accuracy and gives us absolute confidence in the fulfillment of prophecies about the future. And one of those prophecies that, are, that is on God's master calendar that the Bible is really clear about, even though the way it's written and the way you read it through Revelation is really fairly difficult to understand, but if you'll read it carefully and ask the Holy Spirit to help you, following the rapture, there's a time called the tribulation period which leads into a period called the Great Tribulation. What I mean by that, the first three and a half years is going to be a time of tribulation, little t, but there is going to be a time that's going to kick in about the 42-month mark where there's going to be Great Tribulation, Big T Tribulation, and it's going to impact the entire world. Now, I'm going to break this down for you and give to this to you the best I can in the next 25, 30, 35, 40 45. Somebody say it's stop. So what is the tribulation? Now this is going to get really heavy. Are you ready? Say he ain't heavy. He's my pastor. All right, thank you very much. Nowhere in all of scripture will you find one word or description that says anything good about the tribulation period unless it's the promise that it's only going to be seven years long. Moses called it the day of their calamity. Zephaniah said it was the day of the Lord's anger. Paul referred it to as the wrath to come. John called it the hour of trial. Daniel described it as a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. According to the prophet Zephaniah in Zephaniah 1 and 15, it says a day of wrath is that day a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. That day is still to come. If I were you, I'd lean in. If you're a young adult or a teenager, I would lean in right now. It's some of these types of messages that I heard as a teenager, that I heard as a young adult, that caused my heart to be moved and turned towards God. Jesus told us the tribulation will be a time of trouble, a time of trouble without precedent. Matthew 24, verse 21, for then there will be great tribulation such as not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved or would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Those days will have to be shortened, the Bible says, by a third, just so people will survive them. There's so much about this in Scripture, beginning in chapter 4 of Revelation. And because of time, I can only give you an overview, but you can read it this week. I, I would encourage you in Revelation chapter 4 to Revelation 19. Uh, the prophet Daniel has a lot to say about it. But John tells us in Revelation that this time, following the rapture, there will be no... Let me just tell you, give you a 30,000-foot overview of what's going to happen during the tribulation. What is it? There will be, a, there will be no peace. There will be a time of, it will be a time of much bloodshed. Hell and fire will, hail and fire will burn up the earth's grass. It will destroy one-third of the trees. The Bible says this. Intense famine will dry up food supplies. Rivers and seas will become too polluted to sustain life. Some will dry up entirely. The sun will scorch the earth and its inhabitants like fire. A quarter of the world's population will die from war, starvation, and predators. Giant earthquakes accompanied by thunder and lightning will destroy cities. Mountains will crash into the seas. There will be tidal waves. Swarms of insects will darken the sun and inflict painful stings. If we thought COVID-19 was horrible, John says in the tribulation there will be epidemic plagues that will kill one-third of all mankind. And everyone will flee the cities to hide. Other than that, it's going to be a great time. No, it will be a terrible time of trouble. 
Dr. J. Dwight Pentecost said this. He said, no passage can be found to alleviate to any degree whatsoever the severity of this time that shall come upon the earth. However, boy, there's a great however right here. Our hope is found in Jesus Christ. Look again at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our safety, our salvation, our hope is always found in Jesus. So I want my hope to be in Jesus. My salvation is in Jesus. And by the end of this, I'm going to show you how our salvation, Jesus, protects us from this coming wrath. Now, there are certainly different opinions of when the tribulation will occur. I mentioned what it is. When is the tribulation? We believe the Bible teaches that the tribulation will immediately follow the rapture. Last week, I shared with you 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The Bible doesn't say, say that and cause fear to rise up in people. No, the Bible says, comfort one another with these words. I comfort you, brothers and sisters. I comfort you with these words today, that we will be caught up together with them in the clouds, and we will be with the Lord in the air, and we will not be here during this tribulation time if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you want to be here? I want to be here with the, put your hand up in the air and wave it a little bit. I want to be here with the Lord while all this is going on here. So there, there's, a, there's a time of separation. There's a time of rapture. Harpezo is the Greek word that says we will be caught up together with the Lord in the clouds. Now let's go back and I want to look at the 7,000 year master calendar again. Can we do that? I showed it to you last Sunday. If you weren't here, take a look at this, but I've updated it since last Sunday because this, this is what we're talking about today. 7,000 years. It, cor it corresponds to the seven days of creation. The Hebrew scholar or the Hebrews back in the early days, they, they connected the two together. The 7,000 years set to seven days, a thousand days of the Lord is a, a day of the Lord is a thousand years. Ab Adam to Abraham, a thousand, two thousand years. So there's two thousand, Abraham to Christ, another two thousand years. So by the time Christ is on the planet, it's about four thousand years old. And so we have from Adam to Christ, four thousand years. And then Christ to his return, we believe, is another 2,000 years, which takes us to the 7,000 years, the millennium, which is a 1,000-year period of time. So the entire calendar is 7,000 years. I hope you see that. But you'll also see that I updated it at the end of the 6,000-year period. It appears at the end of that time that that's when the rapture would take place. And following that rapture, it would thrust us into this time of great tribulation. All right, so let's just talk about that for a minute. There are three prominent views of when the tribulation will occur. We believe the rapture will occur just prior to the great tribulation, prior to some of those things that I just described happening. Some people believe that there will be a post-tribulation rapture versus a pre-tribulation rapture. There's three prominent views. This is one of them. The rapture of the church, they say, will occur after the seven-year tribulation period. This means Christians will be left on earth to endure the trouble of the tribulation along with the unbelievers. That they will be taken up to be with Christ when the tribulation ends at his second coming. For me, it's very difficult to see how the Bible supports this post-tribulation view. I don't see that at all. Mid-trib rapture, that's what others believe. And there's, there's probably more than the post-trib that would look at it from this uh, vantage point, that there might be a mid-tribulation rapture, meaning the rapture of the church would occur at the halfway point of the seven-year tribulation period. Or maybe they, you, you could also view it like this, that we've already entered the tribulation period, and all the trouble that's going on in the world today is part of the tribulation period, and after three and a half years, then the church is going to be raptured out, and then those who remain would suffer the horrors of the last three and a half years of the tribulation. So, so Chris... This view would say Christians would escape the last three and a half years, of which is when the very worst of the tribulation disasters occur. And then there is the pre-tribulation rapture that we, I say we, I, our, our team, the Assemblies of God, 
Uh, we believe the rapture will take place before the tribulation. A lot of Bible prophecy teachers teach this. This means the church will be removed from the earth before the tribulation. How many of you vote for before? Wave your hand at me. Good, good answer. Good answer. This means the church will be removed from the earth before the tribulation begins, sparing Christians from enduring any part of the seven-year barrage of God's wrath to be poured out upon the earth. Now, this is the view that we, we ascribe to and we believe the scripture best describes for us. And there's one additional view I might just mention, and I have a friend who, who says this, that this is funny, but he, he calls it the pan-trib rapture, meaning it's just all going to pan out in the end, all right? So that is not a biblical view right there, okay? Now, there's a name of a man that it becomes a world global leader during the tribulation period. How many of you know what that man's name is or what we call him? We call him the Antichrist. And his name is synonymous for many people with the tribulation. So let me answer this question. Who is the Antichrist? Now, I'm not talking about something that's somebody's idea. I'm talking about what the Bible says. First, he won't be known until he's revealed and he's not been revealed. So I can't stand up here and say, I think it's going to be this person or this person. No, I, we don't know who it is until he's revealed. Could he be alive right now? Yes. Do I think he's alive right now? This is just my opinion. Yes. How old he is? I don't know how old he is, but I think he's alive right now. I think he's an adult right now, which means that I believe that we are getting closer and closer to the rapture of the church and this seven year period of time. Those are my opinions right there. So does everybody understand that? I believe we're that close. But we know he's called Antichrist because he's not anything like Christ. He's Antichrist. He's everything that Jesus is not. Jesus is everything this Antichrist is not. He will be anti-everything Christ. Can I just say it that way? Because he will be a very evil leader, more demonic than Nero and Stalin and Hitler combined. He will demand total allegiance, including worship. And those who resist will be barred from buying or selling anything. The Bible says in Revelation 13, 16, the Antichrist will require everyone, everyone to receive a mark on their hand or forehead to buy or sell. Revelation 13, verse 16. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. Now, listen, technology is certainly ready for this. I mean, 30 or 40 years ago, if you read this, you might think, well, how in the world could that happen? I, I remember when the barcodes came out. We thought, all right, mark of the beast, mark of the beast. No, it's just a barcode, okay? And we couldn't even think, well, how could that get on everybody's skin, on their forehead or on their right hand? Well, back then, there, we didn't have the technology. How many know the technology is ripe for that today? That would not be a big deal. That technology is already in place. I personally think that it will be a visible mark on the hand or on the forehead where it can just be scanned and scan you. Or you walk through something, and they scan you. Not you. Not you. Or it could just be a chip that's inserted with all the, your information and the information that the world wants from you. But we know that the mark is the name of the beast, the Bible says, or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom, the Bible says, verse 18. Let the one who is understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is what? 666. They say, well, what does that mean? What is that? Well, the Hebrew and Greek language assigns a numeric value to letters. So if you add all the numeric values together from the name of this man, it ends up being 666. The Bible prophesies it. It will happen. There will be a man whose name numbers 666. So if someone has received the mark of the beast on their hand or on their forehead, they will be wearing and carrying the name of the Antichrist. Basically, the person who accepts that has sold themselves, have given themselves over to the Antichrist, and the Bible says that seals the doom of anyone who takes the mark. So I'm here to tell you today that if you're riding the spiritual fence today, or if you're an unbeliever, 
Or if you begin to follow Christ, but then you walk away from Christ and the rapture takes place and you find yourself in the tribulation, hear this pastor right now. Never, ever, ever take the mark of the beast. Now you say, well, I, I, I won't be able to buy and sell. Exactly. And the Bible says that you will likely be strongly persecuted, probably martyred. And you say, well, if I don't take the mark of the beast, I'm going to die. Yes, but you've got a question to answer. Do I need an earthly momentary death or do I want to have eternal death, which taking the mark of the beast will, will put you in that place? Say this isn't heavy. It's the truth. It's the truth of Scripture. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. And the Antichrist's lust for power will not cease until he has the entire civilized world in his evil grasp. And we see that happening. Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 18. I hope you're taking notes. Revelation 13, 1 through 18. Now, I want to give you a biblical overview, kind of this 30,000 foot view of who is the Antichrist. I've got it on the screen behind me. And so the Antichrist is this. So I'm just going to kind of give it to you at a quick blast so you'll know that the, the Antichrist is a ruler during the tribulation who controls the entire world. So there's coming this seven year period of time. And during that time period, this ruler will come and people will begin to say, we're going to follow him. I think he's going to be a very charismatic ruler. I think that he's going to be demonic. I think this, the enemy will, will, will control and possess his life. He's an incredibly wicked person, a man of lawlessness and sin. The Bible describes him as a beast. He will set up an image of himself in the temple and will demand worship. He will exercise miracles through the power of Satan. He will have the ability to deceive the nations. Deception is a big part of the tribulation. He will be assisted by the false prophet. He will kill the two witnesses who, who proclaim the gospel. He will attempt to kill all who do not have the mark of the beast, as we just mentioned. He will eventually destroy the religious system with which he was aligned and get ready to shout. He will be defeated by Christ when Christ returns to earth to establish his kingdom. When Jesus returns as King of kings and Lord of lords, he will return and the Antichrist will be defeated in a great battle called the battle of Armageddon. So Armageddon is a real day at a real place in a place called the Valley of Megiddo. If you've traveled to Israel with us, you've gone on a little bus ride through the Valley of Megiddo. We just drive right through the Valley of Megiddo and we're looking around we're saying, wow, this battle is going to take place right here. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. So we've talked about what is the tribulation, when it is, and who is the Antichrist. Now let's talk about the purpose of the tribulation. The tribulation will be brought on the earth by man's increasing rebellion and rampant sin. Does it feel like it's increasing? Oh my goodness. Rampant sin, pornography, We'll go down the list, Daniel. Sex trafficking. Oh, I won't go down the list. It seems the tribulation is designed to accomplish two things. First of all, to purify Israel. Israel is such a significant part of the end times and God's relationship with man. Secondly, the purpose is to punish sin. Israel exists as a result of God's promise to Abraham. Israel was, is, and will be the apple of God's eye. However, the Jewish nation has tested God's patience throughout the century, centuries, turning away from God time and time again. And Israel is currently away from God. Now, there are some, certainly some Jewish believers but they are currently away from God. But despite Israel's persistent rebellion, God will keep his promise, not only because God is a promise keeping God, but also because he has a deep love for Israel. They're the apple of his eye. 
Yet the tribulation will be the fire that purifies Israel. Moses spoke of Israel's purging in the last days. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 31. When you are in tribulation and all these things come upon you in the latter days. Now think about this prophecy all the way back in Moses' days. He's saying to Israel, you will return to the Lord your God and you will obey his voice. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. That's one of the reasons why we stand with Israel. God is a covenant-keeping God, and he made a covenant with Israel. The Apostle Paul left no doubt as to whether this purging prophesied by Moses would be effective. Romans chapter 11, verse 26, And in this way, all Israel, all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob or Israel, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Who's the deliverer? Capital D. The deliverer is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He will defend them in that last day and on that, in that last great battle of Armageddon. So in the tribulation, God is dealing with Israel. Israel will be saved. Also, God is dealing in the tribulation with those who have rejected him. This is where we come in. Don't reject God. Don't reject Jesus, his son. The Bible makes this very clear. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. You say, well, Pastor Dave, is that me? Because I've sinned. I know that. Is, is, am I going to be a part of that tribulation? God's going to pour out his wrath on me? No, God poured out his wrath on his son, Jesus at Calvary's cross when he took on the sins of the whole world as a sacrifice for your sin and my sin praise God he took his he took my punishment he took the wrath that was designed for me so that I wouldn't have it praise God for that God watch this who is infinitely good abhors evil because evil is the enemy of goodness Therefore, God rightly directs his wrath at evil. God is all good. He's a wise, he's a loving creator. Watch this. Who hates, yes, hates anything that spoils, defaces, distorts, or does damage to his image-bearing creation. That's us. We're his image-bearers. If God does not hate racial prejudice, he is neither good nor loving. You say, well, I hate racial prejudice. So does God. Because he's good and he's loving and he's kind. If God is not wrathful at child abuse, he's neither good nor loving. To paraphrase Dr. David Jeremiah, if God does not hate the arrogance and evil that allows people to beat, bully, kill, and enslave one another, he is neither loving nor good nor wise. But God is all good. And remember, it's goodness, follow me, it's goodness that executes justice. Did you hear me? It's goodness that executes justice. It's goodness that holds the guilty accountable. That's why America's judges and America's courts should hold the guilty accountable. Of course, there's a lot of different situations and you've got to show grace and mercy at certain times, but there's also a place to, to hold people accountable for their crimes. And God is the only fully righteous judge. Praise God for righteous judges in America. There's many of them. But God is fully righteous and fully good and always right. Now here's another question. We've answered it partially, but let's keep going. Can people be saved during the tribulation? Or more clearly, clearly can people who miss the rapture still be saved? Yes, many people will decide to follow Christ after the rapture, but those who are saved during the tribulation period will face very, very severe times. We've already alluded to that. The book of Revelation makes this clear. Let's circle back around. I want you to hear this again. Revelation 20, verse 4. I want you to look at this passage. It says, Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded. Now, that's gruesome, I know, but that's what the Bible says. I saw the souls who have been, those who have been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus. That's happening in the, in the world today. 
Islamic extremists are beheading, are actually martyring, killing Christians for their testimony of Jesus. And those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received the mark on their foreheads or their hands. So, so that type of martyrdom is, is, is in the future. These people came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So they didn't just die and doom for destruction, but they lived, and the Bible says they came to reign with Christ for a thousand years. Daniel in the Old Testament and John in Revelation in the New Testament both clearly state that people who decide to follow Christ during the tribulation period will be persecuted, even martyred, by the Antichrist. So, here we go. I'm confident of these two things. First of all, watch this, listen to this. Believers today will be raptured by Jesus, I believe, before the tribulation begins. And we will be saved from God's wrath. This, my friends, is the blessed hope that we have in Christ. I'm also confident of the second thing. Those who wait. Those who wait to receive Christ until after the rapture will suffer persecution even death, but these new believers will be rewarded eternal life. And I believe Revelation 20 verse 4 makes that very clear. Finally this, I want to encourage you and I want to give you hope as I close. There is protection from the tribulation time. There's protection. I've given you a glimpse of that already, but let's go a little further. The Bible gives us at least four reasons why believers can be assured of God's protection and that believers are spared from this punishment or wrath towards sin. Number one, we are protected because of Christ's promise. Watch this. The clearest teaching of deliverance from the tribulation comes to us from Christ's letter to the church in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. Look at it with me because you have kept my command to persevere I also will keep you from the hour of trial there's a there's a praise moment right there he will keep us from the hour of trial trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth Jesus is saying yes an hour of trial for the whole world is coming but for those who believe those who follow me it's like Jesus saying I've got you I've got this I will keep you from this hour of trial. So Jesus has promised that he would keep us from this. Number two, we are protected because of biblical precedent. Now, if anything hasn't given you an assurance so far that you can be protected from this time of wrath, then this should help you. Throughout scripture, we see God protecting his people by doing what? By removing them prior to his judgment against the evil that's surrounding them. Are you with me? Noah and his family, what? What happened? They were safely within the ark before it started raining. Before the judgment of the flood. And the ark is a type, a picture of the rapture. Lot and his family, we talked about Lot a few weeks ago. Lot and his family were rescued from the city before judgment destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and all the evil of that city. The firstborn among the Hebrews in Egypt were sheltered by the blood of the Passover lamb before judgment came upon the firstborn of the Egyptians. The Israelite spies were safely out of Jericho before judgment fell on that city. What am I saying? I'm saying what the apostle Peter was saying. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but preserve Noah and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, then the Lord knows how. <laughs> then the Lord knows how. How to do what? How to rescue you. He knows how to rescue the godly from trials. Do you see it? Do you see the consistent pattern of God? So we see it through scripture. God rescues the righteous before punishing the wicked. For, so for those post-tribulation people, read this. He rescues us from that time of trial, that hour of trial, or from that judgment and wrath. Number three, let me give you two more real quick, and then we're going to pray. We are protected by evidence found in the book of Revelation. There's evidence found in the book of Revelation, chapter 4 through 19, or tribulation chapters, as I've said. If you've read them, do you know what is conspicuously absent from these chapters? You know what's absent? Or who is absent? The church, followers of Jesus. The word church appears 19 times in chapters 1 through 3, and then from chapters 4 to 19, the church isn't even mentioned. Why? Because we're not there. 
We're not found in the time of tribulation. We have been protected from this rescue, which is the rapture of the church. And then finally this, and I close. We are protected because of Christ's sacrifice. Thank you, Jesus. If Jesus is our Savior, what did he save us from? Jesus paid an enormous price to save us from the penalty of sin. He paid a debt he did not owe. He owed, I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid a debt I could not pay. God is all loving. He is all merciful. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But... He never forces anyone to do it. He just gives you a privilege to be in a place like this or to have a friend share the gospel with you or to expose you to God's love in some other way to where you are, you are feeling the drawing and the wooing of the Holy Spirit that says, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, give your life, surrender all to Jesus so that you can be safe, so that you can quit sinning and offending God and be separated from him. Can I tell it like it T.I. is? That's what sin does. Sin separates us from God. Oh, I know you want to. I know you may even be addicted to it. But God has a power that can set you free. He who the Son has set free, come on somebody, is free indeed. And he wants to set you free from that thing that has you bound. But. You've got to come to him and say, Jesus, I want you. I need you. I want to be saved. I want to quit sinning. I want to follow you and do your will and do your work. That's what he wants. That's what he's called you to. He's calling us to salvation. I know we're out of time, but we're not out of time for this. And that is to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus and repent of your sin. Now, repenting of your sin is not saying I'm sorry. Confessing your sin really says, I'm sorry. God, I've acknowledged that I've sinned. I've confessed. But repentance is this. Stay with me. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is here. Repent, because the kingdom of heaven is right at the door for you. But you've got to repent. Repent is to say, I'm going to have a change of mind. I'm going to have a change of direction. I'm going to have a change of life. And I'm not going to keep going the same direction. See, some people come into church at this moment. They sign up for salvation. They sign the card, they shake somebody's hand, they say, okay, I'm in, and they keep walking the same direction. That's not repentance. Repentance says, I hate the sin that I've been walking in, that I've been doing, and I'm gonna turn around and I'm gonna follow the, follow the Lord Jesus Christ who is pure, who's holy, who is right, who will lead me in the way of life, in the way of righteousness. So, so what I'm saying to you today on this Sunday morning, I'm asking you to be patient with me for just one more minute because I'm asking you to repent of your sin and to follow Jesus and be ready for that great day of the rapture of the church. And if you're watching on online right now, this is for you also. Say yes to Jesus, repent of your sin, and follow him and be ready. Be ready. So let's pray with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I'm not going to ask you to stand or walk an aisle or anything, but I am going to ask you to make a faith decision. And at the close of the service, I am going to ask you to tell somebody or at least tell somebody that you made a change in your life today and you're going to follow Jesus. You can be a family member or a friend, but you need to tell somebody. When you truly repent, people are going to notice there's something different about you. If you're here today, I'm going to just ask you on the count of three, and you say, I want to make Jesus the Lord and Savior for my life. Maybe you once did, but you've wandered a long way away from him, and today you're coming back. You want to be ready on that great day of the Lord. You want to be ready when Jesus returns. You want to be ready even if you were to die today. You want to be ready. You want to be saved. You want to be ready and have eternal life, and you're ready to confess your sin and repent through this prayer. On the count of three, I'm just going to ask you to slip up your hand right now. All over this room, hands are going up. Young and old, men and women, black and white. Come on, everybody, lift your hand. You know you're ready. You know you want to be ready. Today's your day. Today's the day of salvation. Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay, we're going to pray this simple but very powerful prayer. Pray it with me. Dear Lord Jesus, say it out loud. Dear Lord Jesus, I give you my life. I know that I've sinned. I know that I've gone my own way. And today I turn. Today I repent. I turn to follow you. 
I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I ask you to cleanse me and wash me. Make me a brand new person on the inside. Thank you, Jesus, for cleansing me of sin, for giving me new life. I believe that you rose from the dead, and I believe that you're living in my heart right now. Thank you for beginning this work in me, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you are saving me. And right now, I surrender all. I surrender my life. I surrender my will. I surrender my habits. I surrender any addiction. I surrender anything that doesn't please you. I surrender to you. And I ask that you would nail it to the cross on my behalf. Thank you, Jesus. I am saved. And I know that I'm saved in Jesus' name. Put your hands together and say, praise God, I'm ready. I'm ready. You said the darkness run yes. out of it.